I really want to thank you all for coming this afternoon. I'm, I'm kind of a, more than a little surprised particularly since it's the time of the semester that it is. And I know you have other things that you'd rather be doing. If it were me, I, I might come to a talk like this, but I also might think about doing something slightly more enjoyable, like have a second colonoscopy or have a <laughs> prostate check or something along those lines. So I really am grateful that you guys are here today. And, I was graciously asked by Scott Hengstrom, the organizer of this colloquium, to say a few words about uh, the past 30 years of my life here at the university, at this university and another university, and uh, what I've learned from that as an academic. Um, first off, uh, a few words and academic, they don't go together in the same sentence very well. However, um, I promise to keep this mercifully short. And um, I hope as much as possible to stay on topic with uh, what I have to tell you today. Besides, um, like James Berry, you guys know James Berry, the author of Peter Pan? He has this great statement, which is, life is a long lesson in humility. Uh, I've humbled myself many, many times and will continue to do so in my life here. So um, I want to start by uh, telling you guys giving a framework for things that I want to talk about uh, today. Over the years, I think I've discovered, for myself anyway, that there are three things that have deeply motivated me in terms of who I am and what I do. They direct how I teach, they direct how I interact with people and how I live my life. And uh, those three precepts are, are these. The first one is, to always act with compassion towards, it's easy to do with other people for me. It's not so hard sometimes, not so easy to do to myself. The second of those is to um, constantly be grateful for whatever I've got um, because there are always people that are gonna have less than what I have and um, certainly when it comes to friendships and uh, support of people, there is so much gratitude that, that I have for all of that stuff. Um, and um, then of course, there's the last one, which is living your life with as much passion as you possibly can manage to muster here. The first two of these, the compassion piece and the, uh, the part about gratitude could be semester long topics, uh, sermons in and of themselves, uh, particularly the gratitude ones since it's got these double benefits to it, you know? Being gratitude makes your life a whole lot better. And the person that you're grateful for and towards, it's the exact same thing. It makes their life better as well. So you're gonna get two for one on that one. So I think that's, a, that's an easy one. But what I really wanna talk about to you guys today is that incredibly powerful engine of passion. So uh, what is this thing called passion? Well. Uh, you guys recognize Stephen Hawking, right? Stephen Hawking was diagnosed with ALS when he was 21 years old. He's given a life expectancy of two years. The man is now 74 years old and still kicking. He has one muscle that he can control in his cheek that allows him to talk and to communicate. But beyond that, the man has the same incredible intelligence that he did at age 21. So whatever kept him going when a diagnosis said that he was going to die in two years, I think that's what this passion thing is all about. And you can see it in other people as well. Not David, but the guy who carved David, Michelangelo. This guy was incredible in terms of his devotion and he kept carving into his 80s. And Grandma Moses, she didn't even pick up a paintbrush till she was 78 years old. Good grief. And now she's moved herself into the, the history of Americana. And she is the ultimate uh, example of Americana. Of course, you all know about Einstein. At 26, he's working at a patent office. Why he didn't stay there and continue to be a patent officer, but instead went on to change our whole understanding of the universe, I could only begin to know. I would love 
to have had a conversation with that man. And then, of course, Gandhi, uh, a man who motivated hundreds of millions of people to direct their lives toward a passive and successful endeavor to free their country. An amazing man as well. Every single one of these people is motivated by that thing called passion. So sometimes it's very difficult to identify exactly what it is, and you have to look at the examples to be able to understand that. But um, I want to tell you for just a, a brief moment here uh, um, a remarkable story. Um, I think that um, actually most of you probably realize that there is this um, amazing period in your life, in your early teens, uh, early 20s, late teens, where you have the capability to do everything adult, but your mind isn't mature enough at that point to be able to tell you, this is not a good idea, or this is a good idea. <laughs> I bet every single one of you have an example from your own life where you go, geez, oh, Pete, I'm glad to be alive still today, given what I did in my teens and in 20s. And I'm no different than that. And I, I want to tell you real quickly about one of those stories. Um, when I was 19, uh, myself and four other people decided we were going to do, do the classic Western road trip. So we... Uh, we had a canvas-covered kayak called a full boat, which we loaded up on the van. We traveled out to the western United States, and the, one of the first places we hit was the west coast of Washington to Olympic uh, National Park. Great park. Spent the, the morning climbing around on the upper peaks there, and it was beautiful. And in the park, coming out of the park, going down to the ocean, is a um, really beautiful river called the Ho River. The Ho River is full of glacial milt. You guys know that's the ground up fine rock. It's beautiful, it gives it this really nice green cast to it, but it also means you can only see about six inches down into it. That's about the maximum depth that you're gonna see. So uh, being young and I wouldn't say foolish, but perhaps, uh, we decided that two of us were gonna take this full boat and put it into the river, and we're going to send the other three down to the ocean, and we're going to meet them there at supper time. Okay. On the map, it looked like you could do it anyway. You know, asking questions at that time wasn't really high on my list. The idea was cool, and so we were going to do this thing. So we, we put in to the river, and we started floating down, and it was cool for about the first half mile. Then the speed of the river starts picking up a lot, and you start getting these logs reaching out from the side, these sweeps they're called, that come into the river. So that meant you had to be constantly going back and forth to avoid getting caught in one of those. Well, we came around a curve very fast in the river bend, and there was one of these sweeps right coming out of the side of the river, and try as we might, we couldn't get around it. As a matter of fact, we got carried right into it. The kayak flipped, and as I was trying to hold it up, I snapped one of the paddles, and the other paddle went on down <laughs> the river, okay? We, we had to bail ship at that point, and luckily, I grabbed the drag line, and we could pull the kayak into shore. Now we have one kayak and half a paddle, <laughs> and the road out, is on the other side of the river, okay? So now we got a problem about how are we gonna get out of here? So luckily this sweep that went out did go almost halfway across the river. And so we clambered out to the end of it and then we started to think about, okay, okay, what are we gonna do? I, I, we're gonna have to jump in and then we're gonna have to swim as hard and fast as we can because one, we'll either go into hypothermic shock and not be able to successfully make it or two, the current is going so fast that we're gonna get just torn dead to our death down the river somewhere else, caught in one of these strainers and it, it's all over. So it took me almost 15 minutes to work up the courage on the end of this log here to jump into the river and make that swim across it. So finally, with my eyes closed thinking, push me somebody. 
I made that final leap into the river. This milty water is going right by, and I splash into the water, and it's eight inches deep. <laughs> and I turn around to the person on the log, and I go, it's OK. You'll be safe. <laughs> and at that point, walked out. But you know what? I look at that experience, and I think, my god, that's just like life, right? Sometimes you build this up to be something enormous and big and frightening, when in fact, it's not so bad at all. And sooner or later, you got to get to the other side anyway. So coming up with that courage to overcome it, and I did figure out who pushed me. There's that passion piece that tells you you got to do something. You can't just sit there. You got to do something. So the, the whole example there of the, of the river was a great lesson to me about the use of passion and the fact that it can motivate you to do incredible things. In the words of one of my heroes, Miss Frizzle, you're all familiar with Miss Frizzle? From yes, yes, good, excellent. Her, her great saying was, take chances, make mistakes, get messy. That's such a great piece of advice. It is so easy to sit back and say, oh, I don't want to embarrass myself. I, 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 I better not do that. The fact is, passion demands of you certain things that get you messy, have you making mistakes. That's the best way to learn. And so um, I really um, I think it's such an incredibly powerful motivator out there. Um, finding those things that kind of kindle your own fire, that uh, find your own true passion, sooner or later, there is going to be a moment in your life where you're going to realize that the hand on your shoulder is actually passion telling you, go this way. And it will, it will direct you. I, I honestly believe that. In a, uh, there's a fictionalized a biography of Michelangelo called The Agony and the Ecstasy. I don't know how many of you may have read it. Uh, but the author, Irving Stone, recounts a conversation between Michelangelo and he, one of his early mentors, a renowned painter. Michelangelo started out and left the tutelage of this painter to actually become a sculptor. And when asked by this mentor why he would leave such a promising career in painting, Michelangelo replied, I did not choose sculpting. It chose me. Even if I wanted, I could do nothing to stop the joy and ecstasy of chiseling in stone. It's just what I do. We should all be as lucky as he was in terms of discerning what it was that would be his passion in life. I think we have all got hints of what our passions are, but maybe some of you as students are still waiting to figure out exactly what it is. All I can say is this, if you listen, you'll find out, you'll know, uh, it'll come to you. Um, I don't know if any of you recognize this guy. Anybody know who this fellow is? This is a guy by the name of Everett Roos. It's no surprise that you don't know uh, who this man is. I actually became acquainted uh, with the story of this guy over 30 years ago when I started exploring the canyon country of southern Utah. Um, this guy, during the early 1930s, at the age of 15, he started to ex take extended solo trips into the rugged canyon wilderness of uh, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, that area there. He wrote these feverishly intense letters back to his family at home about the beauty and the vastness of the wilderness. Beauty that he so strongly felt that he feared he would almost explode with ecstasy sometime. For four years, he took trips into the desert southwest, each time staying a little bit longer and going a little deeper into the wilderness. It was after one of those extended trips that Everett wrote his two rules for living, and that is never count the cost and never do anything unless you can do it wholeheartedly. Now, I don't say this is good advice, but I will tell you, add a little bit of frontal brain activity to help you discern between what is safe in consequence and what's not, and this becomes a really great adage for life. Um, the, uh, at the age of 19, Everett actually slipped back into the Canyon country for the last time. 
he was never heard from again. And whether he died or whether he just decided to forsake the civilized life for a lifetime in the wild, no one really knows. But what we do know is that in his short life, he lived very purposefully and very passionately. You know, passion too can remove lots of impositions, and so lots of things that we impose on ourselves as limits. We realize that even if we don't succeed, at least we can try, we can do our very best. There was a woman in the early 1990s, um, and seven years after she had graduated from uh, the university, she considered herself to be something more than a failure, to be a, a dismal failure in life. And uh, her marriage had completely collapsed. She was jobless, she had a dependent child, she was living below the poverty level and taking government aid in order to make things work. It wasn't really very surprising she was diagnosed with clinical depression and she actually contemplated suicide as a way to take care of these problems and this mess that she had created out of her life. But you know, she absolutely loved to write. And even though her life was collapsing around her, she continued to do that. 1995, she managed to finish writing an entire book and promptly had it rejected by 12 different publishers. But she kept at it. Finally, a year after those 12 uh, publishers said no, one publisher said, eh, okay, take a risk on this. They printed 1,000 copies of this book, 500 of which they gave to libraries, thinking they were gonna have a little trouble offloading the other 500. She was told she would never make any money to live on off of this, she'd have to get herself another job. But the passion that drove her to do that writing in the first place is the passion that carried her through, not just through that first book, but through, at this point, more than a dozen books. And of course, we're talking about the book, the um, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, and we're talking about J.K. Rowling. That woman was incredibly energized by this passion to write. And I, I've seen a lot of people overcome a lot of stuff with passion, but she's really kind of a poster child for that. Quite a remarkable, remarkable woman. Um, I need to tell you one thing, and that is that the uh, quest for passion is not without its costs. But somehow those costs usually pale in comparison with the joy and the fulfillment that uh, that spirit of having a passion about something can actually bring you. You know, I look at people that get out of bed at 5 a.m., five days a week, just to pound the asphalt, to, to go running. I don't think they get a huge amount of joy out of it, but it's something they do because they're driven to do it. It's a passion and there's a cost associated with that. For some of you, that passion may be the thing that keeps you up till 2 a.m. Um, writing a lecture. Okay, that would be me. Uh, it, it, it might be writing a grant, running an analysis. For many of you, it might be studying for an exam. You guys are passionate sometimes about studying for those exams. Those are all great things, but there is a cost associated with it. Long ago, I started calling this cost of passion the lasagna effect. Um, there is nothing in the world I love more than a great meal of lasagna. Give me that green salad, glass of really fine red wine. It is, it is to die for, okay? That, I, I can think of nothing better to eat. However, when you're sitting at the table and you've just finished that plate of lasagna, and someone brings you another plate, and then you can see coming out of the kitchen is a third plate as well, and then a fourth and a fifth, and all of a sudden you've got so much lasagna on the plate, even though you love it, you're passionate about it, it is just way too much. So, be cautious. Passion can take a hold of you and cost you far beyond anything that you're willing to pay for. So uh, beware of the lasagna effect as you walk out there in life and deal with this idea of passion. Um, I think one of the other things that's really important about uh, passion is the, the antithesis of it. 
The antithesis of passion is apathy. And for you, you millennials that are out there, um, you, you've been given the, the cute name of apathetics because many of the millennial generation just are relatively apathetic. They're, they're as I mentioned to my class this afternoon, they're the folks with the car just idling in the driveway, you know, roaring that engine, but haven't stuck it into drive yet. And they may or may not stick it into drive. Driving is what life is about, and passion is the thing that fuels that uh, move that you make. Um, I, I want to take a, just a brief moment and um, tell you about that idea of engaging. And uh, if you bear with me, I want, I want to show you a quick clip from uh, the Shawshank Redemption. Um, I had lunch with a colleague today, and this topic actually came up. Uh, how many of you have seen the Shawshank Redemption? Oh, excellent. It is such a, a fine movie. And as you all know, it's written by uh, Stephen King. And um, there is a particular piece in there that I find to be very, very important. What a great line. Get busy living or get busy dying. Um, it's all about moving. It's all about doing something and going forward with it. And I think the advice that Andy DeFries or Stephen King has is something that applies to all of us. Don't just wait on the fence. You could be there a long, long time. You need to start moving yourself somewhere and in some direction. So uh, I'm going to paraphrase my, uh, my hero, uh, which is, I have many of them, but one of them is Henry David Thoreau. He said, oh, God, to have come to the end of your life and find that you never really lived, what a tragedy. What an absolute waste. So I don't know where you are in your life's journey, because there are going to be moments when you're stuck always. But getting off that fence, moving, getting busy living, or getting busy dying, important, important things. Um, I'd like to tell you one last story, and then I will, uh, as I promised, be merciful and be done. <laughs> but um, when I was in grad school in Colorado, I was uh, stayed up late one uh, weekend night uh, reading a rather moving story about the rec reconciliation between a father and a son. And after I was finished, I, I got dressed. I went out for a long walk in the starlight and I returned about one o'clock in the morning. I was so full of gratitude, so full of love for all that my dad had done for me that and all that he'd put up with for the last 27 years that I had been his son at that point. Uh, I figured that I needed to call him and tell him that. <laughs> now, now, my folks lived in Detroit, and this was Colorado. There's a two-hour time difference. So it was already 1 a.m. on Sunday morning, which would have made it, what, 3 o'clock in the morning in, uh, in Detroit? So with this spontaneous impulse born of the fact that there are no guarantees in life, and how would I ever forgive myself for not telling my father how much I cared about him? If I didn't do it right now, I called home. And the phone rang several times, and then this sleepy voice comes on the line. Hello? Hi, Dad. It's, it's me, Eric, your, your son. Suddenly, he gets really alert on the phone. He goes, Eric. Eric, it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Is everything okay? Are you hurt? Was it an accident? How Sue? And I go, oh, Dad, Dad, it's fine. Everything's perfect. I just wanted to call and say how much, how much I love you and how much I appreciate you. And I really want to thank you for all the things that you've done for me in my life. There was a long and silent pause, and I thought, oh. <laughs> My dad is really choked up by having me call him and, and tell him all this stuff. Finally, I hear his voice on the other end of the line. He goes, son, are you drunk? <laughs> uh, 
Of course I wasn't. But if I had maybe told him that before, it wouldn't have been such a great surprise to him. And I, I think about all the times that I haven't let my passion overtake me and let me send those messages and tell those people what they mean to me, how important they are for me. You know, that story that I just told about that actually comes back to the very beginning of this whole thing. And that is, that story is about acting with compassion. That story is about being grateful for what you got. And that story is about living my life with passion. And um, as I sit here at the end of the career, I'm going to lose it. <laughs> um, I'm moving into a different phase of my life. And uh, I really can't begin to say how incredibly grateful I've been for all of you that have played such a significant role in all of that for me. And um, I hope that all of you can find what it is that drives you that passion that lives behind what you do so incredibly well. And I've been so lucky to have not only a wife who's put up with this, but incredible colleagues that I've really loved working with. Also, um, some great bosses to work with, some incredible secretaries to support the crazy things that we do here. And most of all, you guys as students, man, if you only had a clue as to how much energy you provide to all of us uh, that are serious about what we're doing, it's quite amazing. So with that, I just want to thank you all. And um, let's go out and have something to eat, OK? Yeah.